Okay, now it's alpha things back. Okay, so actually it's uh, uh, not about AI in general, but hybrid AI, and I will explain in a minute uh, what that means, but I will start with a, a yeah, simple logic um, uh, task, which uh, we discussed yesterday in a, in a way. So you can ask ChatGPT uh, a question like, Adam and Eve are the only two people in the room. The person next to Adam is happy. The person next to Eve is sad. And which of the ones is happy? And at least uh, the version 3.5 of the, of the model uh, gives the wrong answer. So uh, nope, there, there are some problems with logical inferences in, in, in large language models. And my talk will not about, uh, be about uh, ChatGPT or large language models in particular, but rather on a general approach on how to deal with this kind of general challenges in, uh, in, in the field of AI. And uh, if you look at it, there are actually two strands of, uh, of AI or two categories. There's on the one hand, uh, symbolic AI, which, is, um, which encompasses knowledge representation and uh, this is described as giving reasoning and, and semantics and this is knowledge driven and it is, it is human readable and machine readable at the same time. And it's very good at uh, making knowledge explicit and, uh, and traceable, for example, for provenance. And yeah, we had a talk about semantic web uh, in a minute ago. So this is the main technology here, which is important where you make knowledge uh, explicit and can do with, uh, with ontologies, can do logical rules and reasoning and so on. And on the other hand, we have, um, uh, we have sub-symbolic AI. Um, sorry. Uh, Subsymbolic AI, um, which yeah works with statistical methods, so it's machine learning uh, in a general way. is described as uh, doing learning in an empirical way and is data driven. And it's the important thing: it's not readable for humans, but only for machines. And uh, it's uh, very great at um, processing vast amounts of data. Um, and yeah, you know the applications uh, like word embeddings, object detection. Uh, Deep, uh, deep learning and so on, and ChatGPT, of course, also belongs into or falls into that under the under that category. You can also look at it in another way. So both of these uh, types have different input and output. If you're doing it with symbolic AI, you have uh, symbolic data like triples in an uh, RDF file, and uh, you can define okay, uh, queen is a subclass of uh, woman, and Maria Theresia is a type of queen, and from this you can logically infer that Maria Theresia is also of type queen. And uh, on the other hand, in subsymbolic AI, you uh, enter structured uh, structured or unstructured data. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, and then something happens, and then also subsymbolic data or data that is not symbolic uh, comes out. Um, and both approaches have their various advantages and disadvantages, of course. Also, I had an example for this, but yeah, you know this. Um, so both approaches has, have uh, advantages and disadvantages. The symbolic AI is uh, very resource intensive. Uh, it's very hard to get enough data and to actually build a knowledge graph with uh, semantic web technologies. And uh, sub-symbolic AI machine learning has no semantics at all and no provenance, which is problematic in another way, of course. And uh, since a few years, um, there are people trying to put both of these approaches together to, to mitigate the uh, respective dis disadvantages in the, in the two fields. And this is... Uh, yeah, another umbrella term, hybrid AI or um, neural symbolic AI, it's sometimes called as well. Um, the uh, observation is deep learning uh, systems are way more performant if there's a knowledge graph in the back background. And uh, such a combination could also mitigate some of the societal disadvantages like interpretability of uh, ML models, transparency and trustworthiness and so on. And um, the idea gained uh, very much more traction in the last few years in computer science with the breakthroughs and on LNMs, and you can read very much in the last few months also about, about this. And the question is now, of course, uh, yeah, can we use this as historians? And uh, if yes, how can we use this for historical research? And we are, of course, dealing with the same advantages and disadvantages uh, in our field, as, uh, as, I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned before. So I would uh, argue if we want to, uh, if you want to do that, if you want to employ the advantages of hybrid AI, we should take a look. Uh, at what else happens in this field, especially in computer science. Um, like with all methods in digital history, we have to look where do these methods come from and uh, what can they do and what can't they do. And then we can decide if this is uh, something we can use. Okay, so what can we build? And the first question is, of course, how can we build such a hybrid AI system? Because actually, there's not a single way to do this. Um, 
yeah, there's an important work by uh, Frank van Hamelen and Annette Tenpey, uh, who uh, wrote a paper on, uh, yeah, they call it boxology. It's basically a set of design patterns to create hybrid systems. So design patterns are an established mythology in uh, computer science to model complex systems on a very high and general way. And to do this in such, such a way that it is reproducible and comprehensible. comprehensible. And the basic question with this uh, is um, always in each of these models, which tasks in a system can be done by machine learning and which tasks can be done by knowledge representations. And as you can see, this, uh, this is used as the basic building block, which I introduced before. And uh, just as a side note, um, there are certain people in AI research and computer science who demand for a theory of AI, um, and which would then have to follow in uh, a hybrid approach. And this uh, boxology is noteworthy because it is seen as one of the possible, uh, uh, as a possible groundwork for such a theory, uh, although it is uh, still very informal. Okay, so this is now the state of the art approach. Again, what can we do with this? And uh, I, would, I would like to discuss this with a very small case study from the project where I work. And um, yeah, then discuss uh, uh, the potential use for us as historians. Mm. Okay, and the, the project uh, I work in, we, um, we work with uh, heraldry or heraldic sources, coats of arms, uh, and uh, study the um, usage and development of coats of arms. So coats of arms were an extremely common European Middle Ages and early modern phenomenon. Um, there's a great object diversity, as you can see, and uh, they were very powerful and versatile use for visual, communica visual communication. And uh, by that way used from yeah, most uh, classes uh, from peasants to nobles, and they could communicate possession, dominion, jurisdiction, group affiliation, and so on. And uh, as uh, Sophia uh, mentioned, here's the same problem that meaning is strongly dependent. So meaning of a single coat of arms is strongly de dependent on the respective concrete historical context of use. So one coat of arms does not, does not always mean the, mean, the same thing, yeah, mean the same thing. So this makes this an important uh, historical source. And in the project, I'm just glancing over this, we have a few um, uh, yeah, historical and methodol methodological research questions we are interested in. And uh, I want to also um, point out that I'm of course not doing this alone. So I'm part of a, of a larger team. And uh, at this point, I, uh, yeah, I especially want to mention the uh, number of student assistants who uh, work on the data cleaning, data preparation, data editing in this project. Without them, this, uh, yeah, we wouldn't have as much uh, to work with. Um, okay, again, in this project, we have two, two strands. One is the visual analysis on the, on the Curtis Arms, which is um, a machine learning approach in general, and uh, the conceptual approach where we uh, yeah, try to describe Curtis of Arms and contextualize them in a knowledge graph. Um, and as part of this, we build a um, yeah, modular ontology built of high parts, which can describe single coats of arms, which can um, place them in their material context, which can describe this material context and also the historical context. I'm just glancing over this so that you get an idea what, uh, what we're doing and where all this uh, comes from. Um, coming back now to hybrid architectures, uh, or to how our hybrid art architecture is, is, uh, is designed. So this would be the, um, the structure for the process in, uh, in our project. So we have an, um, an unstructured image, uh, image data from a historical source, presumably with coats of arms. And uh, these uh, images are then being fed into an uh, object detection model. We, uh, we trained ourselves and uh, this yeah, detects coats of arms which are on the images and where they are on the image. And um, these object de uh, detection results are then transformed into IIIF. And IIIF is being represented as JSON LB, so a linked data format. So we can integrate it in our knowledge graph and yeah, have it in the same system, so to speak, with uh, the description of these codes of arms and the information on historical context. And uh, as you can see, this is uh, actually a similar design principle as in this uh, design pattern explainable learning systems with uh, background knowledge. So in other words, you could say uh, we are constructing an explanation uh, for the results of the machine learning process or give context to the results of the machine learning uh, uh, results that are, this, the, the, uh, yeah, that are defined by humans. And this can then be analyzed together in, in a way. Okay, but what I'm describing now and what I've described up to this point is uh, in itself mainly about opening up historical sources and providing them for further research. 
which is of course the goal of most uh, current knowledge project and ML projects. But uh, how can we go beyond that? How can we, uh, yeah, use this as a tool to uh, to, to to analyze historical sources or visual source uh, in my case, which was the overall question of um, of his contribution, of course. Um, okay, and for this, I want to discuss with you a very small uh, case study um, as a yeah basis for this methodological question. Um, this is uh, very much still work in progress uh, since, since it is uh, mainly intended to explore exactly these uh, these questions. Um, but to come to the object of study, we are here dealing with uh, armorials and manuscripts. Um, these are basically collections of coats of arms in book form. Um, and they are or were uh, commissioned by a, a wide range of, uh, of social groups from nobles to merchants to heralds. Uh, they have hold uh, a wide range of, um, of functions like support of claims or commemoration or uh, transfer of heraldic knowledge. So in essence, again, for heraldic sources, this is a very important source. And what is important for us now in, in this context is that they uh, include various forms of visual um, uh, representation or presentation. So as you can see, there are, um, there are a number uh, down, uh, down here, uh, a number of different um, layouts. And these layouts, how these uh, codes of arms are arranged are of course not meaningless. So um, they can communicate different things like, like uh, here on the right side is uh, uh, hierarchies or this in the middle uh, can communicate uh, allegiance between, uh, between two entities. Mm, yeah, group identity, structures of uh, territory power. So this is important how these codes of arms are arranged from a um, historical point of view. Um, okay, and what is important, of course, is size and uh, location of the code of arms to interpret this. Mm, and there's also a recent study on, uh, on these aspects, uh, which I just mentioned, which is a, follows a classical non-digital approach, but which uh, is important because if gives us an idea about what is important in this domain and what we have to look for. And the question for us now is, how can we scale this up, so to speak? How to, can we do this with more sources and can, uh, get a broader idea on, on this type of source and how it was used? Mm. And I will uh, yeah, do this or start to do this by examining two research questions, uh, which I limit because of time. The first question is, uh, how can we infer which types of layouts are being used in in which manuscript? So to, so to speak, um, no, so we have a certain kind of layout like this one, uh, which means something in general, and who uses this? This is the question. And the second question is, can we detect how codes of arms are being presented across multiple different manuscripts? Hmm? So these codes of arms are reused in different contexts. And the question would be, um, yeah, how is one single code of arms or a group of codes of arms used in another context as well? Hmm. And uh, yeah, to do this, we can of course, uh, yeah, do a clustering approach based on on similarity of the single manuscript page. But uh, in this case, we are not interested in the codes of arms themselves. So in this uh, image, we are not interested, but only how the codes of arms are presented. So the size and the positioning again of the codes of arms. And um, therefore, we can for our study just use. Uh, bounding boxes of our object detect or from our object detection detection process. So again, where is the coat of arms and how large is this? These are the relevant information. And this can again be uh, transformed into a NumPy array where, yeah, basically one is, uh, there is a coat uh, of arms and zero is there's no coat of arms. So it's a, um, yeah, really boiled down to the essential aspects and thereby can easily be fed into uh, different machine learning libraries and, and algorithms and we can work with that. Mm. Okay, yeah, and the idea is of course that um, these are very dissimilar so we can detect which pages are similar to each other, which arrangements are similar to each other and which are not. Mm. Okay, and I uh, tried this out. I uh, did a few different uh, experiments uh, with PCA, TSNE and uh, with an uh, autoencoder model um, also in, uh, experimented with uh, some oversampling techniques to um, like smooth for example to uh, yeah deal with imbalance in in data um, but uh, and afterwards the results were always clustered with k-means but this is just a short context um, 
these are the uh, best results I could uh, come, come up with in, in the time. Uh, they are not perfect, but still uh, very usable regarding some, um, yeah, regarding some, as, uh, some aspects. These are just the um, most important clusters that you get an idea what, uh, what comes off of this and just to illustrate the most central and unambiguous findings. And uh, okay, so these ML uh, or these machine learning results uh, now have to be made explicit in the knowledge graph so that we can query it and uh, research uh, or study it uh, inside their uh, historical context. Um, okay, and from the step from before, we have of course the result, which manuscript page uh, belongs to, to, to which of these, of these clusters. Mm. And these clusters, or I should say here, these clusters from before, we can map these to uh, RDF classes we define, and uh, these classes can be fed into the knowledge graph. So basically, uh, each page is an, has an instance in the knowledge graph, which says, okay, this is this page from this manuscript and it's this page number and so on. And uh, now I can add the information, this page is, belongs to the cluster so and so. Um, to come to the, or, yeah, to point out the uh, most important clusters, uh, what was um, the result of the, of the experiment we have, um, pages where codes of arms are on the left side and have text and we have ones where they are on the right side and have and have text we have uh, this one the uh, which could point out to allegiant but uh, inter interestingly which is uh, very seldom used which is an immediate r result from this um, and you have uh, three different clusters that uh, do this kind of structure and also from a machine learning perspective uh, if maybe someone has an idea um, this one and this one uh, yeah, I could not distinguish uh, this by image clustering. Maybe someone has an idea afterwards how we can uh, better approach this. And I will also, we will ignore this for now, but there are also a few errors in the annotation and the machine learning results. So this will just disregard for the purpose of this, of this talk at least. Mm. Okay, and um, now since uh, we are asking ourselves a methodological question out how we are, uh, yeah, how we are dealing with all this as a, as a, um, as a science or as a as humanities, as a historical studies, uh, we have again to look at uh, materiality because the um, obvious interpretation might be this, uh, that these are uh, five different or four different um, clusters, four different things. But uh, we again have to go back to the sources, look at the materiality, and then see that this left one is actually one cluster because in most manuscripts, um, you can see this is just a double page where. The, uh, code, the visual depiction of the coat of arms is on the outside. This just again as a, as a small uh, remark on the side. Hmm. Okay. Um, what did I forget here? Okay. Ah, yes. Okay. Of course. Uh, what can we do with this? Uh, so, with this uh, results, we can uh, at once ask, uh, answer a few research questions since, as I said, the information um, which page a cluster belongs to, which uh, in which way the codes of arms are arranged. Uh, this is linked to the to metadata, for example, on the manuscripts themselves. Hmm? So I can uh, I can, for example, ask in which types of manuscripts, in which manuscripts, or where do the manuscripts come from that use this particular uh, style of layout or this particular style of layout. Hmm? So I can do a study on. Um, yeah, how manuscripts in different regions of Europe, for example, depicted codes of arms. Um, and this is, of course, only possible since we um, yeah, did uh, this connection in the beginning and uh, did not consider uh, the machine learning part and the semantic web part as two different um, aspects, but uh, since we integrated them uh, together. Another, uh, just a short example I want uh, to point out, uh, we can also, um, yeah, mitigate errors uh, that are coming from machine learning ta ta tasks with this. For example, we uh, might want to understand how the code of arms from this layout cluster were used elsewhere in other manuscripts. Mm. And uh, yeah, because as I said before, layout and arrangement of codes of arms is important to reduce communication for rank and hierarchy, for example. And uh, yeah, as you can see here, or here, uh, one of these coat of arms is uh, visually differentiated by the by the rest of the of the page by its size and by its tilt and also by this uh, helmet and crest the thing uh, this is uh, this is on the on helmet and 
uh, in general, this often does indeed represent that the entity on the left side is an overlord of the entities depicted by the other codes of arms. Okay, but practical problem is now uh, these uh, layouts have been clustered together in our machine re learning results. So uh, how can we differentiate this in uh, when we're doing a, a, a study of this? Um, how can we, uh, for example, ask uh, this particular code of arms here, is it um, represented in such a hierarchical, hierarchical superior way or in a, in a lesser way like somewhere here? Mm. And um, yeah, again, we can employ the uh, explicit facts from the knowledge graph because uh, the fact that um, uh, this coat of arms here has a helmet and a crest and is the only coat of arms with a helmet on a crest in this page. This is also encoded in the knowledge graph. So I can uh, write a short um, Sparkle query, which uh, basically says, okay, I want to every other instance of this particular coat of arms. Um, in another uh, of these of these layout clusters, but it must be uh, the one, the only one with a crest and helmet on a on a particular page. Okay, so uh, this way I have uh, somehow, in some way, mitigated the the error from before that uh, that these two things, which are dissimilar from a historical point of view, um, I have uh, separated them. Okay, but since the time is short, I want to come to a um, to a short conclusion and um, to sum up a few preliminary results or um, more accurately, uh, in my opinion, starting points for a discussion about hybrid AI in historical uh, studies. Um, so a part of, um, yeah, I would uh, point out as a thesis that uh, a part of making historical sources available will be hybrid approaches in the future to allow for more complex analysis so that you can uh, process large amounts of data, but also enrich them in a semantically way and do this in, in one system. Um, this was mentioned a few times before uh, by Paul Ramsch and by uh, Mrs. Vioni. Um, so what you want to do is make information queryable for, for, for historians. This is something which should not sound very new because it's already happening, um, but I, uh, Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I observed uh, this is uh, seldom happening uh, with a combination of these two aspects, the sub-symbolic and the symbolic aspects, and even sel more seldom under the term of hybrid AI, which means in the best case that there are uh, two me methodological reflections and discussions, one in computer science and one in history, but they are detached from each other. And then in the worst case, it means we don't even think about the methodology uh, implications of uh, hybrid AI in, in our field. Um, another thesis would be that uh, we, by this, we can uh, maybe accelerate the visual turn by providing flexible interpretation frameworks. The Sophia study is a, uh, would be an uh, argument for, for, for this, or a good example for this. Um, I would say we uh, have to talk about um, the, the methodology, which is also something which has been uh, touched upon by uh, Michaela Bignoli. Um, so as she said, we need uh, a refinement of methodology, method, methodology and, uh, and methods. And this is um, true for this as, as well, I would argue. And uh, another aspect is human as part of hybrid AI system. So we have uh, domain experts in our now field working with data. Crowdsource was uh, mentioned a few times before. OK, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Okay, humans as a part of hybrid AI system. Now I can't see my notes. Okay. Ach, Mensch. Yes, but... Uh, okay, I, I tried uh, this way without my notes. So uh, one important aspect I would say is uh, humans as, as part of a hybrid AI system, I haven't touched upon this, but this is also a discussion going on in computer science. There's actually a large research center in the, in the Netherlands, which main uh, interest is, okay, how do, we, how do we create a culture where we, um, where we work with AI on problems and how do we integrate humans on this? And maybe we are not thinking about enough about this. Maybe we should, we should take part in such a discussion. And that's another point, but I can't. Uh... Ah, yeah. Um, large language models as part of hybrid AI systems is, is another aspect which I also haven't touched upon. But uh, if you try it out, 
again, even with uh, version 3.5 of ChatGPT, you can, with a prompt, create parts of a knowledge graph. You can create ontologies from text. You can also query knowledge graphs with ChatGPT. So there's some interesting point maybe in the in the future or in the near future even. So in general, I would say we should perceive more and uh, reflect on, on discussions and discourses on further development and AI that are not part of our field, but that are never, nevertheless very relevant to us in, in many ways. So that's, that's it, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs>